The story begins with Elijah Bryant. Her family tree traces back to a free woman of color. Polly Simmons was born in North Carolina in 1804, had at least four children, Eliza, Buckner, William, John, and possibly Nancy and Rufus. Though the Simmons were of free status, conditions for persons of color, Native Americans and blacks, free or not, began to deteriorate in North Carolina in the 1830s, culminating with the Supreme Court decision Scott v. Sanford in 1857, which determined that all persons of African descent lacked the rights of citizens. The state of Ohio did not allow slavery and became a route on the Underground Railroad as early as 1815. The city of Cleveland, located on Lake Erie, was becoming a mercantile center. Trade and jobs expanded with the opening of the canal connecting Lake Erie to the Ohio River. Needham Bryant, a Cleveland Mason with ties to North Carolina, and Eliza Simmons applied for a marriage license in Cuyahoga County Court in 1853. The rest of the Simmons family settled in Cleveland in 1858. Polly Simmons was known for opening her home to people of color needing help. Eliza modeled her behavior on her mother's exemplary life of service. She provided basic essentials of food, shelter, and care to those in need at her residences on Garden Street and later on Newton Street. Needham Bryant died leaving Eliza with no living children. The community became her venue for service. Black women at this time were banding together to improve their communities. Through the Black Women's Club movement, women established orphanages, clinics, and homes for their aged. Black women in Boston and Philadelphia supported homes for the aged and became models for other cities. Clevelander Edith Jackson visited the Pittsburgh home for aged colored people in 1893. Her report to friends led Sarah Green and Eliza Bryant to mobilize the community in support of a Cleveland home. Meeting at St. John's AME Church and at members' homes, the group named a board of trustees in 1895 and incorporated in September of 1896. In 1897, the Cleveland Home for Aged Colored People opened its doors to the first residents, becoming the first non-denominational philanthropic organization organized by and for a minority population in Cleveland. The Cleveland Home for Aged Colored People represented the African American community's commitment to service and their ability to find financial support. Black residents were not accepted into white nursing homes or state facilities at this time and for decades to come. Fundraising within the community became essential. In 1898, Cleveland's black business leaders volunteered to become legal and financial advisors. Their daughters, nieces, and wives, however, became the backbone of management. Lethia Cousins would marry the first black city councilman, Thomas Fleming, and become one of the most well-known female leaders in social reform and in Republican politics. The women appreciated the founders. Bolden wrote in 1903, I do not feel that we can sufficiently express our appreciation of the promoter, Eliza Bryant, and the band of Earnest Women Incorporators. Eliza Bryant died in 1907, followed by Polly in 1911. Both are buried in the community they served at Woodland Cemetery. Foreseeing the changes in organized philanthropy, the Home for Aged Colored People created a formal men's auxiliary in 1902. By 1908, these men had tightened the administration, raised money, and created public awareness. George Myers, who ran the barbershop in the Hollanden Hotel and held influence with Republican giants in Cleveland, led the community drive to raise money for the home through the public event at Gray's Armory celebrating 30 years of freedom. The first location was at 284 Giddings Avenue in Lexington at a cost of $2,000. Only two residents were initially served, but the number grew soon to 12, plus the matron, Mrs. Sally Barnes. The needs outpaced the ability of the house to serve. The lack of indoor plumbing led to the expansion and move to the second location, the Osborne home at 2520 East 39th Street between Scoville and Woodland. Two days before occupation, the home burned on Thanksgiving Day 1901. The insurance company refused to allow a claim since the structure had not been occupied. John D. Rockefeller initiated a challenge grant 
and then made an additional contribution which paid off the mortgage in 1903. Costs went up. A 1905 ad in the Cleveland Journal noted a one-time fee of $150 to gain a lifetime stay at the home. Within a few years, costs had climbed to the $300 to $500 range. The Cleveland Home for Aged Colored People moved in 1914 to a third location due to the need for bigger space, better plumbing, and a better location. The brick house on Cedar Avenue accommodated 19 beds at a cost of $9,000. They remained at this location for 53 years. The powerfully connected community women gained the support of the organized charity work in Cleveland when the home became the first official charity of the Citywide Federation for Charity and Philanthropy, established in 1913. The home continued as a Red Feather Agency when the Federation reorganized as the Welfare Federation of Cleveland in 1917 to make charitable giving more efficient and tax deductible. Fundraising was done through the community chest and distributed to the 88 member agencies. Despite the efforts of the dedicated volunteers and leaders, the home continued to survive on a hand-to-mouth budget managed by the women as America entered the Great Depression. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt created a new deal to correct the inequities brought on by the economic and social turmoil of the 1930s. New Deal programs launched for the elderly included Social Security, but were of little influence on the African American community since most domestic workers were not covered. These years brought change. The Board of Lady Managers became Auxiliary One and continued generating funds and providing for needs. The daily management shifted to a paid administrator, Bessie Love Blue, niece of Welcome Blue. This beloved matron created a junior board, or Auxiliary Two, to expand support for the home among younger women. America, following the end of World War II, saw changes in race relations, health care, and philanthropy. The Supreme Court decision in Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education in 1954 ended school segregation and raised expectations. In 1957, the Federation became the United Way Services and raised money through the United Appeal. This philanthropic federation began questioning their support for smaller nonprofit organizations. It is around this time that a young lawyer came to Cleveland and became involved with the Home for Aged Colored People. So we commissioned a report from Hobart Jackson, who was, at that point in time, one of the outstanding people in the country when it came to African American nursing homes. He eventually wrote a report and said, this is a very necessary service that the community has to address. And that is that people of color do not have any place to go when they get older. The recommendations of that study included a change of name and expanded diverse board of trustees, a goal to increase the facility to at least 60 beds to keep the home self-sustaining. In 1960, the trustees chose to honor the founder by naming the home after Eliza Bryant. Her portrait reminded those trusted with the care of the elders about the mission of the Eliza Bryant Home for the Aged. The board expanded to include individuals with diverse skills and backgrounds at a time when urban flight pushed populations to the outer rings of the city. Bill Ginn, graduate of Yale Law School, was a partner in the socially conscious law firm Thompson, Hine, and Flory. Bill Ginn, what a man. He's one of the few that I have seen in my lifetime that would help mobilize people to want to become endeared to this village. We saw, I remember, uh, the breaking ground of this facility. Bill had tears in his eyes, knowing that uh, one day he would see what we now have. Uh, when he pulled out his checkbook, he would write a check and smile. Dr. Amasa Buzz Ford was a specialist in public health and the newly emerging field of geriatrics at Case Western Reserve School of Medicine. Another uh, force in the city without being forceful. A force in the city by being nice, 
Amos Afford was a pioneer in geriatrics, and, and he entered medicine at a time when the field of geriatrics really didn't exist. And it was my dad's work in urban health where he really saw how the medical needs of older people are different than that of a middle-aged person or a younger adult. Changes in the source of funding stimulated demand for expansion. And then the Huff Riots of 1966 changed the direction for the Eliza Bryant home. When the Huff Riots came, no one touched an old mansion that was on Addison Road because in that old mansion was a nursing home called the Dorcas Society. And that was a home for genteel white people. It happened that our law firm represented the Dorcas Society. While they survived the riots, they were petrified at the possibility that there might be more and the, and the community was falling apart in Huff. So they decided that they were going to move all of their patients out of Dorcas and put them in the suburbs. So I went to the Dorcas Society and I said, the Eliza Bryant Nursing Home would love to have your building. And they said, oh, no, we couldn't do that. We couldn't give you the nursing home. Having been repulsed, I went back to them and I said, let's cut a deal. You lease it to us for one year, for one dollar, and at the end of that year, we will be back. Of course, they had no use for their administrator, who was a lovely lady. We hired her to run our new nursing home. She knew the neighborhood, she knew the people that she had had in there, and she knew the opportunities that it would present. That worked out so well that some of the genteel old ladies decided they wanted to come home. So we suddenly had not only our own family to care for, but also members of the Dorcas family. At the end of the year, I went back to them and I said, well, what's your decision? Will, will you give us the home? They said, yes, we will do that. You, we've proven that you can operate a nice nursing home even with our administrator. In 1967, the Dorcas Society offered their building at 1380 Addison Road. Donald Ford remembered his father bringing him to the Dorcas home. My first memories of Eliza Bryant Village, and I was a, a, a fairly young person at that time when, when my dad started there. He brought us and wanted to show off everything that he was doing. I thought it was a ghost castle, and I thought it was cold and scary until I went inside and there were just the nicest, warmest people I'd ever met, and they were very happy to see me. The Dorcas Mansion was costly to operate and inadequate for expansion. There were no elevators. There was no handicapped access. There was a great big sitting room where the ladies would go to sit and talk, but it was not very conducive to the type of nursing care that people require. The board decided to rebuild within the community. This fundraising project demonstrated how connections and vision help. Reverend Hilton Smith and Congressman Lewis Stokes led the community campaign to raise money for the expansion. The 1980 campaign was one that I will never forget in my lifetime, with so many families involved. Uh, so many volunteers involved. You had the Bill Gaines of the world, the corporate support. You had the people in the community that could not give the corporate dollars, but they had corporate minds. It was a campaign that uh, was filled with love because of what Eliza Bryant has meant to this community. One of my partners in the practice of law was on the board of Forest City Hospital. And he was there because that was a hospital that doctors of color had admission privileges and hospital privileges that they couldn't get at all the other hospitals around. But then the Forest City Hospital, because they couldn't get paid by the third party vendors quickly enough, had a cash flow crunch that ended up in their going into bankruptcy. They eventually collected all of their receivables from the third party vendors, such as the US government, Medicare, Medicaid, the uh, private insurance companies. They collected their past bills with the force of the bankruptcy court behind them. And they ended up with a really 
staggering surplus in the bankruptcy. It was unexpected by anyone. So I went to the bankruptcy judge and he did the audacious thing of uh, distributing part of Forest City's assets to Eliza Bryant. The residents at the Dorcas home had to move earlier than thought. It was funny. The, the actually, the new building was not totally ready for occupancy. There was a, a furnace to heat up this huge mansion. It would come on with a bam, and everyone would, if, no matter how many times it turned on, you would still jump every time it came on. The boiler, which they'd been tinkering with, you know, it, it was just about to go. Well, it went in February. The old fella just gave out. It did its last bang. So what we did, and this is to show you the work ethics of the staff and, and how dedicated they were to the care of the residents. We didn't have a bus. So what everyone did, from dietary to activities, to the nursing staff, to, to the cooks, we brought our cars and we moved those residents to the new building. In 1973, the board chose a new name to reflect the widening scope of activities, the Eliza Bryant Center. The buildings were completed at a cost of $5.5 million, raised from the city of Cleveland, the federal government, the Forest City Hospital Foundation, corporations, board, and staff. Expanded staff provided legal and professional expertise necessary to provide care and access new forms of funding. Harvey Shankman brought his credentials and experience in social work and health administration to Eliza Bryant. Our greatest strength has been our CEO, Harvey Shankman. Harvey seems to be abreast of everything that's going on in development for seniors. I was able to bring back new information, innovative approaches that were being utilized around the state and implementing them at Eliza Bryant. The Eliza Bryant Center opened in 1985 in the Huff neighborhood. I always like to describe us as a jewel in Huff. You know, if you know anything about the history of Cleveland and the Huff neighborhood, it's been rough times over the years because I had the pleasure of growing up in that time frame and we still survive, so we care, and we generally would like to be the first choice of when people want to come to a, a, a nursing home, because this is an experience. It's a cultural experience. We communicate well with the families because you know, this is a partnership. Some cases, you know, they're able to go back home, and that's, a, that, that's when it really feels good. In some cases, this is the last place that they'll probably be. This is their home. Here was a place that was culturally competent and where the food and the entertainment took all those cultural issues into place. It's, you know, hard enough to leave your home and, and have to be institutionalized. But it certainly helps when, you know, there are some things that are familiar to you. Some of the programs and activities were actually more the black experience. For instance, having gospel and the Sunday services and just the little extras. These efforts brought new generations of women and men into volunteer work, ensuring the legacy of service going back to the founding of the home. One generation taught another through example and doing. My mom, because I was a newly practicing attorney, she said, well, this will be a great way for the world to find out about you why don't you advertise in one of our brochures or booklets for one of our functions? And I did so. But that was only the beginning. After that, Imogen Nolan, the perpetual Eliza Bryant icon, if you will, of volunteerism, contacted me directly and said, you know, Corky, why don't you do more than just advertise? Why don't you become a part of the family? And here it went. Imogen introduced me to Eliza Bryant, and the love affair began. My very best childhood friend lived here, and she had already been a very faithful member of Auxiliary, too. 
And of course, she wanted her best friend to join in. And my friend was Imogen Nolan, and we dedicated a bench and a tree in her memory. Well, I had a dear friend, and she told me for years all the things, wonderful things that were happening at Eliza Bryant, and that was Misi Taylor. I decided to come on in when, um, with her encouragement, and she was already serving on the Board of Trustees. A friend of mine reached out to me and said that they were aware of an organization that was looking for some young people. And at 33, I didn't know I was still considered young, but I was happy to hear that. And so they were asking for some that were interested in leadership positions and, and particularly serving on a board. The auxiliaries continue to provide a human touch. The auxiliaries kind of step in and take care of those other needs, the things that just make life better at the village. We know that the second Sunday in December is the Christmas party for the residents. So we hope that the members of Auxiliary 3 will not plan anything on that day. And usually on that day we come in and we have a Santa Claus that will deliver the individual gifts. It's just a joy to put a little sunshine in their life on that day. At this time, we still are doing the same thing. We're having teas, bowling parties, and we've had concerts and items for sale at raffle off events to raise funds for the center. Each auxiliary has a specialty that they perform in order to raise monies for Eliza Bryant. Auxiliary one, they lately have been doing a high tea. Auxiliary 2 usually does a fashion show, and Auxiliary 3, uh, they've come from many different venues, but right now we put on a music fest. If there's a project that they feel that all three auxiliaries should work together on, then we'll come together and work with each other to do that. When they throw a senior party or a senior prom, just anything, just everybody joins in and they are working towards helping the residents enjoy it. And also there was a community garden. But that was great because some of these people had, you know, come from a rural society and being able to grow their own vegetables. When I first came in 1989, Eliza Bryant consisted of a 100 bed nursing home. Over the last 25 years, we've been in a period of perpetual growth. Around 1990, we initiated the adult daycare program at a time where most people didn't know what adult daycare was. These are folks who have cognitive and physical challenges that prevent them from staying at home by themselves. Usually they have a caregiver that will care for them in the community and we will provide respite for the caregiver during the day. And it allows the caregiver to work, go to school, or just have an opportunity to relax and, and be themselves and, and, and just get a break because we know as a caregiver that this can be challenging and overwhelming. We initiated a transportation program as well and we were able to expand some of our community services. As we approached our 100th anniversary, we were very successful in raising about two and a half million dollars, which allowed us to build an expansion to the nursing home. In 1999, we opened up the first of our HUD 202 housing building, and that was our 60-unit manor building. In 2000, we actually acquired another inner city nursing home called Madonna Hall that was on the verge of closing. And we were able to run that facility for a three year period while we planned for an expansion to Eliza Bryant. The people that came from Madonna Hall were a different type of people. They were younger people. Many of them just had mental health issues. The next move was very organized, but it was also a very compassionate, dignified move. And they were being uprooted from a home that they loved, that, but it was unsafe for them. So we had to make sure that they felt welcome. So what we did 
everyone ordered the same color t-shirts and it had welcome on it. And we had a slogan of holding hands so that they would know we're reaching out our hand to them. We went to the old facility and picked them up in limousines. And as they came through the front door, the staff was there to welcome them with open arms. In 2003, we also had another opportunity to open up our second HUD 202, which was our garden apartments. And these apartments are, are very unique in that we built them in little units of four. Uh, each of the buildings had a cathedral ceiling as well as a bay window. It captured attention from around the country because it was so unique in design. And then lastly, our most recent HUD 202, which opened up in December of 2008, was the Amasa Fort Lodge, which again was a very beautiful building, which had a two-story atrium and a large fireplace, just a beautiful addition to our campus. We have a skilled rehab, we have intermediate care, we have a memory care unit, and we have a total care unit. That's the nursing home portion of our village. We also have an adult daycare, and we also have independent housing. So you can transition from one part of our village to another part and never have to go anywhere else. You can start out at the nursing home, skilled care, get back on your feet, and then we have apartments that you can eventually move into. So we cater to the whole person. In 2015, the Center for Dialysis Care opened its doors at Eliza Bryant Village. Unfortunately, there's a high prevalence of a requirement for dialysis in the African-American community, a little higher than in the majority community. So we're delighted to have them here on campus. People that reside here will have a short bed ride to go get dialysis, and that's huge, not only to this facility, but to the neighborhood. Through the history of the Eliza Bryant home, it has been people who are at the heart of its success and growth and have adapted to change. And we are not given the same pot of money that we have been in the past, although that the seniors are sicker. However, you have to be creative. We will find our way through our ingenuity to continue to support our mission. Unfortunately, the need will always be there. So it's incumbent upon us to be the sharpest when it comes to providing that care. We have elected to stay in the community that we are in, where other entities have moved after uh, the dollars, if you will, to the suburbs and to the private care side of the industry. The care at Elijah Bryan has changed for the better. They are no longer here just to rest. They're here to live a full, dignified life and we see much less depression than we saw before. You can see people gone out of pearls, gone out of long dresses. There you have your jogging suits, your hats turned backwards, your tennis shoes on, and they want a happy hour. I can remember the first time I saw a resident going home again, and it was like a party. We stood at the door, and we waved and we were just happy to see them go because that gives your care a better acknowledgement. Eliza Bryant has become a multi-service facility and neighborhood center compassionately caring for the elderly, a place of choice for loved ones. I have brought family members here and I, and I would bring other family members here. And if I needed to be, I would, I would come for the care. My first instruction on how to care for people that lasted me throughout my entire career. One of those ladies who was really strict, she was like a nurse ratchet, and, and her shoulders were always straight and she never slumped, and the uniform was pointing and, and starched every day, not a spot on it. I think she had about a fourth grade education, but her care for the people started me on my way. Recently, I had the opportunity to return that favor. She was a resident 
on our dementia unit. She no longer knew me, but I certainly knew her. And I had the opportunity to give her that dignified, compassionate care that she gave me. And to me, that was priceless. What began as a story of a small group of concerned women helping those in need has expanded to a physical presence within the heart of the African-American community in the Huff neighborhood. We're recognized by foundations such as the Cleveland Foundation, other centers. We're hoping it won't be the best kept secret in Cleveland. And I think it's not anymore. <laughs> With the nursing skills, we have first class service. One of the greatest treasures of the Eliza Bryan Village are the people who work here. They are just marvelous. I, I can't say enough about them. If I were to see Eliza Bryan today, I would say to her, we've exceeded your expectations. We are still serving the vulnerable population that you set out to at the beginning of your mission. I would say to Ms. Simmons, uh, because of your vision, the village is here. The village has multiplied over the years the people that are involved with Eliza Bryant, inspired by what the village has done over the years, inspired by your vision, inspired to want to help somebody as we pass along the way so that our living will not be in vain. Today, Eliza Bryant Village is the oldest continuously operating African-American long-term care facility in the nation. In 2016, it will be 120 years since women gathered friends together to help elders who had no one to care for them in their old age. The vision continues. If Eliza Bratt was here today, I believe she'd be tickled pink. Eliza Bryant Village has had an incredible impact on Cleveland's history. For more than 120 years, it served some of the city's poorest and most fragile citizens. That enduring legacy of service has been longer than many venerable institutions in this town, including Cleveland's chapter of the American Red Cross, United Way, and even the Cleveland Foundation, founded in 1914. That service has been made possible because of our dedicated board of trustees, our committed staff, and an incredible group of women's auxiliaries. With your support, we'll be here for another centennial to serve your loved ones. So thank you, Eliza Simmons Bryant, for your vision, and thank you, Cleveland, for your support and your continued confidence in us.